It's slow. That's okay, but warning to everybody else, it's slow. Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the opening of our academic year here at the Herti School. And I should say I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here in person, but I'd also like to remind you that we have several people who are here online as well, and I will try my best indeed to look at the back of the room to where that camera is. Now, in terms of how things run, I should just say, and when I see the different people here and all of you wearing masks and being distanced, I want to thank you for not only coming, but for following, of course, our rules. We'll talk about different sorts of rules, but one of the things that we have as well, of course, is always being a bit flexible in terms of thinking about our implementation of our rules and how things run, and we simply run things as they go. That's why we're a few minutes late. We simply had to get everybody through the process. I'm delighted to see you, and of course, we'll have a reception. We'll have an opportunity to talk in person at the end of the opening. Now, one thing that we wanted to do this year is talk about our overall school leadership. Uh, we have five individuals here um, on the stage. Of course, I am Mark Hallerberg, acting president. We have Axel Baish, who is at the end. You will see him without a mask soon. If you don't know who he is, you can see what he looks like without a mask now. Uh, we have Andrea Rummela, who is the Dean of Executive Education, Mark Kaiser, Dean of Research and Faculty, and Christina Ray, who is Dean of Programs. I think it's important that you get a sense of who we are. Some of you know who we are. For some of you, this is the first time you're here and you see different things. And so you're going to hear different voices talk about areas that they are responsible for. But of course, my colleagues do a lot of other things too. And one way you'll get to know that is indeed if you approach us at the reception, if you can come to the reception, or if you're online, if you approach us and say hello at other times. Now, a goal for today is to talk about simply some themes. Why do you have an opening ceremony? Because you reflect on things that are coming. We, we reflect on the things that are new. What would we like to be doing? Of course, we have things that have been set here for a while, but we have certain things that we care a lot about and we'd like to set the tone for different sorts of initiatives as we move forward. One is engagement with our communities. This involves our Berlin community, our academic community, our international communities. One is diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is something that we have been talking about when we first had our diversity and inclusion task force. We recently had an anti-discrimination task force. And as I stressed back in June when we talked about this as a school community, this is a process. This is something that continues and we want to talk about more, especially this academic year. Sustainability is a theme that matters a lot to the school. Matters, and when I say the school, I mean the things that we do as a school internally, not just externally in terms of policy, advice, or research. Finally, of course, we will continue to commemorate uh, President Enderlein in different sorts of ways, and we'll talk about some things that are coming and heartily encourage you to attend different events that are still in preparation. Now, in terms of milestones, last year we had reaccreditation of our MPP and MIA. Very, very nice things to announce and discuss. We had a new program that was accredited, our Master of Data Science, and I know some of you have come from our MDS, but we never really end with accreditations, it seems, here at the Herti School. And one of the big ones, of course, will be our PhD program. Thinking about things that we've done before, thinking about the success of, of our PhD researchers and our professors as we look back and again look forward. Also, Civica, uh, I think uh, Christina Ray will say a few words about Civica when she comes up. But of course, this is our um, alliance that we have with seven other European universities. And this will be an opportunity to renew it, reflect on things we've done before, but we expect that it'll become an integral part of the Heritage School in many different ways. So these are things that you'll be seeing in different sorts of ways, but I wanted to at least introduce the themes, and I would also like to introduce right now the Dean of Research and Faculty, Mark Kaiser. Thank you. Uh, this is, uh, will be brief, and I just wanted to let you know about the faculty, that faculty uh, whom we have here, uh, 36 of them now, and you can see in these pictures here on the wall behind me, uh, how large we have become. Uh, for those of us who've been here for a longer time, and I count myself 
among that number, this is uh, quite an impressive achievement. We have three new faculty members about whom we're extremely proud. Uh, we have here Ruth Dittelmann, who is our professor of social psychology, coming to us from where she was a researcher at the WZB on the other side of Berlin. And we have two people who just joined us this August, so last month, who are sitting here in the room with us today, and they're trying to avoid eye contact right now, <laughs> right? And uh, I would like to maybe just, I know this is embarrassing, but please bear with me. Could I ask you to stand up when I uh, uh, announce the two of your names together? Right, uh, Lynn Cock. <laughs> Lynn has joined us from uh, ETH in, in Zurich, and she is our new, and by the way, first professor of computer science here at the Hattie School, who's playing an integral role in uh, our data science lab, but our MDS and our Masters of Data Science for Public Policy program. Uh, Welcome, Lynn. All right. Sitting just two seats over from Lynn, who knows what's coming right now, is, uh, is Ariana Arnaghi. <laughs> Ariana is also very fresh and uh, has been a professor since all of August, one month now here at the Hattie School. Uh, she's a professor of economics. Uh, who specializes in uh, accountability and microeconomics in, in, in many dimensions. And she comes to us from the University of Warwick uh, on, uh, in the UK. Uh, glad and wonderful to have you here, Ariana. Right. The contribution of these uh, two professors who've just joined us now brings us up to a total of 36 professors, and you can see our growth over time here at the Hattie School and the pinnacle that we've reached here in 21-22, right, thanks to our uh, recent additions. We've never been this large, we've never covered this many topics, and I'd like to think we've never been uh, this excellent, as good as we are. On that note of excellence, I would like to turn over the baton here to our Dean of Graduate Programs, right, uh, Christina Rey. Need to lower this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very warm welcome from my side as well. Uh, I'm excited to be here and to see you all here. Many of you, probably all of you, have seen me uh, since your arrival last week uh, for Welcome Week, MPP, MIA, and MDS, and this week for the Executive MPA Welcome Week. Very excited um, to, to be here. Mark already talked about our faculty. There's one group of uh, people, uh, parts of our community we rarely speak about in, in forums like that, and that's our adjunct faculty. I would like to mention those as well. They're very energetic, very committed, uh, all of them uh, teaching our growing student body to which we are coming uh, in a moment now. So I would just like uh, to mention that particular group of our community as well. Did I go back? No, yes. Students, uh, so what we have grown in is faculty, uh, adjuncts, courses and programs, but also students. You see uh, our student numbers over the past years and you see we are at a record high at present. Um, 685 students, that includes you all on campus, first uh, and second year students, sometimes third year students in the EMPA, and of course PhD students, 71 at present. And it also includes a lot of our students who take a career a break, well, that's the wrong way to put it, a study break uh, to pursue a professional year between the first and the second year. We've got 110 uh, of those at present. They are off campus, but they remain, of course, our students. Mark already announced that I would like uh, to say something about Civica. Before doing that, a few words about the GPPN, the Global Public Policy Network. We're part of that network. We're very proud to be part of that network. And one, I'd like to mention uh, especially the um, issues of interest to our students. Uh, one thing our students can be involved in is the 
conference, the annual GPPN conference. It's taking place here at the Hattie School, uh, live in March, we hope, we think, um, 4th to 6th of March. And the call for student teams to compete uh, in that conference is going to be out soon. Keep your eyes open for that call, uh, apply for that call. The great institutions are part um, of GPPN, um, LSE, Tokyo, um, for instance. Keep your eyes open and uh, yeah, apply if this is something that interests you. The other initiative we're part of and have been part of for the past years is CIVICA, the European University of Social Sciences. These are eight uh, institutions, uh, Sciences Po, Bocconi, um, LSE, among others. And there are various ways in which you as students can get uh, involved. If you would like to know how, there's an info session on the 21st of September that is going to be run. Uh, by Irina from Communications, by Enora from the President's Office, and uh, several students who last year ran an uh, initiative called Future EU, which was a policy brief writing competition in cooperation with the Jacques Delors Center, will also be there and talk to you about the opportunities to get involved in Civica. I should say one thing, and I think that's very important, Civica isn't just about Europe. Europe is the overarching theme. But the, there are four uh, research themes in Civica that also include crisis of earth, uh, democracy, so issues that go well beyond uh, Europe. So do get involved as students, as faculty, of course, too. And yeah, we look uh, forward to welcoming you in that network if you're not yet involved. I think it's Mark again, Hallerberg, that is. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm just going to touch a bit more on the themes, or we'll lift these up a bit, um, that we'll be exploring this year. One is indeed engagement in our community here in Berlin. It's something that I often refer to as our place in Berlin. What sorts of things do we do in Berlin in terms of maybe some volunteer activities, in terms of engaging different types of communities? This is the start of something, and I intentionally using my space here simply to announce some events and activities that are coming in the next month just to remind you what indeed is on the docket. One thing we have is a so-called mechanisms of government series. These are different types of policy briefs that several members of faculty have been preparing in the run-up to the German elections. These will start to appear next week on our webpage and intentionally they're in both English and in German because we want this to be accessible to the German speaking world here in Berlin as well as the English speaking world. It's a way of bringing in some of the things that we learned from our research and being able to apply them in interesting sorts of ways that are relevant for the ongoing election campaign. Now we may also be curious about who's going to win and how well forecasting models work. And I think Mark Kaiser has something to say about that. I think Simon Munzit here in the front row has something to say about that. And there'll be a nice debate just before we actually know who's going to place, I don't want to think win, I guess. I think that's also something that would remind me of. It's where the parties are going to end up finishing and what this then implies. But we're going to have our faculty talk about this in very interesting and informed ways just before the election on September 23rd. We're also going to talk, and I know Andrea Romano has been working a lot on this in terms of some post-campaign ideas and how different sorts of things will play out once the election is done. Now this is a focus very much on some of the electoral angles precisely because we're in Berlin during an election. And I want to encourage you to look around and really get into the election even if you don't speak German. In fact, because there are a lot of the ways that EU citizens can participate and EU citizens can vote in local elections, I have been seeing an unusually high number of posters and the like in English. So even if you don't speak German, try to engage and see how things go. And you may know that one of our alums helped co-form this party called Volt. I've seen a lot of things for Volt as well. A lot of heritage history, even in even one of the parties. So please enjoy the election. I say this as someone, as a sort of policy geek who really thinks elections are cool. Uh, but make sure that you, and keep in mind, it's not just something at the federal level, but it's also at the city level as well. The theme I've touched on before, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to stress, first of all, and announce that we have a new office after, the, I'd say, in the next few weeks, by the end of this month, in fact, a diversity, equity, and inclusion office. This will be based in the president's office. I think it's important that this have a central role in our administration, and that's one reason why it needs to be in the president's office. 
Um, some of the duties a diversity and inclusion officer will take on are things that our current diversity ombudsperson, Bashik Chida, have been doing, but she's been doing this as a faculty member. The move will be to have this as a part of the administration, somebody with some legal training, and somebody who can uh, push some of these themes further here at the Herji School, also deal with different types of cases and different sorts of things that come up, especially involving students. Now, I mentioned that it's a diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just diversity and inclusion. And when we think about equity, this is leveling up people that may come from certain types of backgrounds and where some sort of help might be really, really useful for those persons to be back on a sort of a common playing field. And we're introducing a mentoring program for first generation college students with the idea that when you come, especially to a graduate school like the Herti School, if it's the first, if you come from a family where you're the first person who's ever been and got a BA, let alone going into a master's program, it would be very helpful to have basically some mentoring in terms of how things go. Uh, I see Eduardo Campbell here. I want to say thank you for helping to prepare some of these things. And it's something where I th we really hope to push this forward together, dealing with people who are, are uh, people, talking with students, talking with faculty and postdocs and others to make this indeed a reality. We also, of course, will continue, as I had mentioned before, the process of thinking about our anti-discrimination task force and some of the recommendations. And indeed, I'd like this office to help prepare some of the things as we move forward. And so what you see, we're a policy school. We see the administration being put in place first, talking about what administrative things we can do, making sure we have people who are responsible in place, and then we will indeed move forward. In terms of sustainability, I said before that sustainability is a theme for the campus, not just a theme in the German elections or worldwide. That's important too, that's not what I'm saying. But we wanna think about and reflect on what this means for us. We wanna monitor different sorts of measures. We have a sustainability committee. Um, Carolina Forst, uh, Ute Gutter have been very active. Axel Beisch here as well has been very active. Uh, uh, Christian Flaxland with our sustainability committee. Uh, we will be rolling out a series of measures on campus. I have been joking with the first year students that we made sure that their folders on their tables were recycled. That's just a concrete example of things that the Sustainability Committee looks at. But we will have a sustainable action plan. We will talk about carbon neutral energy supplies, eco-friendly products in terms of how things run. We'll even talk a little bit about what we eat at the Heritage School, I think. So we've got some interesting sort of themes as we move forward, but it's about bringing sustainability to campus and in some sense to home. I also want to point out some things we're going to do for Henrik. I should say every time I get I see this picture, I get a little teary eyed. I still very much miss him. I think it uh, would be an opportunity for us to have indeed a moment of reflection. Uh, the alumni weekend is coming up and I should say I think Henrik had more students than any other professor here at the Herti School and one way to bring in those alums and some of you, I imagine, are either in this room or indeed are online right now, is that we're going to have get together Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Um, this Henrietta Herz Park is quite close to the Potsdamer Platz. That would be the U-Bahnhof if you were headed that way. But we'll just say a few words there and together walk to Pariser Platz and to the Brandenburg Gate, where indeed the Jacques Delors Institute that he founded was originally located. We will, I would also like to announce, and I'm very happy to do so, that we will have an academic symposium uh, in Henrik's honor the 9th and 10th of December. We will do this jointly with the foreign ministry. I've said several times that there are many Henriks. There was the sort of public Henrik, the political Henrik, the academic Henrik, the student Henrik, the professor Henrik, and we will honor the, the academic Henrik on December 9th and 10th. Everybody will, of course, be invited, and I, I announce both of these because I'd love to see you there, if at all possible. Now, I think it's time now for me. Those are the main themes and things that are coming up. I'd now like to turn it over to Andrea Gomela as the Dean of Executive Education. Thank you very much, Mark, and also from my side, a very, very warm welcome to Berlin, to the Herti School, and it's really wonderful seeing so many of you, seeing so many of you in person, but also uh, um, a big hello to those who are joining us online. Um, 
I've been with the Hertie School now for 11 years, and I really, I, I mean, Mark, when you showed sort of the, uh, our growth in terms of faculty and in terms of uh, student numbers, um, it's, um, I think it's a real big uh, success story. And I hope I will see many of you in the seminars I teach. I teach um, political communication and I'm also sort of um, a campaign nerd. Sort of this is um, my time every four years. I get completely excited and um, I'm more of a news junkie than I normally am uh, because of the election. But I, I hope I see even more of you uh, when you have graduated and then come back to the Hertie School, uh, you know, in your then professional roles and do some of our executive education uh, uh, formats. The executive education unit at the Hertie School was, I mean, it has sort of started as a small startup, probably 2015, 2016, but then was uh, then installed also with the deanship in 2018 and has been growing ever since. We as a, uh, as a professional school also want to have a footprint um, in the executive education world around the globe. Um, currently, the executive unit is struggling more than 70 projects. And once we are allowed to travel more again, we um, hope that um, you know, lots of the seminars and, and offerings we now have online will take place at the Hurti School again. And then you as students also have the opportunity to mingle with really very interesting, fascinating, and very diverse uh, crowds. Just to give you an idea of uh, how broad the portfolio of executive education is, I've um, uh, chosen two projects I would like to briefly introduce to you. We are very closely working together with a Brazilian organization called Republica. Uh, uh, Republica um, has as its mission to um, revolutionize, quote unquote, the public sector in Brazil. And they work very closely together with us as a school, but also with executive education in developing certain formats uh, on the broad field of public sector uh, for Brazil. Uh, then a second uh, project um, we are very closely engaged uh, with is um, a Nigerian project. Um, the School of Politics, Policy and Governance is a very small, um, very vibrant new governance school in Nigeria and they choose us, the Hurti School, as quote unquote their role model and we sort of advise them on curricula uh, um, matters, on faculty matters and so on. I know, know Mark and also Helmut uh, here in the audience uh, have also been very much uh, involved in that. It's a very fascinating project and I think these two very very different projects give you an idea of uh, what the portfolio of executive education is. And now I'm very happy that you left this here, Mark, because I now, Axel, I call Axel uh, here. Yes, thank you. Let me see. How, how do I move it? Here we go. Oh, that was one more. Good. So good evening, uh, dear students, dear colleagues. Great pleasure to be here. Just a few words uh, on two rather small topics before they, we then turn to the main act uh, of the evening. Um, to our alumni network first. Um, when it's talking about the alumni network, and some of you are rather close to being an alum, second years, some first years probably will take some more time uh, to join us. Um, Upcoming is the, the uh, alumni reunion this weekend, Friday uh, to Sunday. Um, you may take part in many events. If you can't take part in person, many of them are live streamed. But uh, looking at the graph we have here, uh, we call it a living network. And this is really something very dear to us and, and close to our heart to keep working on it. So of course, the alumni affairs manager is Giovanna, Giovanna Panish, she's an alumna uh, of uh, your of, of the school, uh, 2017. More than 2,000 um, members were strong. And if, if we say living network, what does that mean? How does that materialize? First of all, in the reunion once a year, yes. 
Second of all, that's new, has been last year's success and hopefully will be this year again one, is the Herti Alumni November, which is a whole month where we do loads of activities within all the, you see it down here, 13 chapters worldwide. Of course, there are more alumni to us, with us than in those 13 chapters, but those 13 chapters are of quite some size, be it from Geneva, rather small one, to New York or Washington, rather bigger ones. Um, and we coordinate on common themes, the Hearty Alumni November. Then the next big thing we do once a year, and we couldn't do that during the pandemic, is the conference. And the next conference is planned is on health and AI, and it will be taking place in Delhi and possibly Bangalore in India next spring. So those are three main topics. But apart from this, many, many things take place. And one of the most active chapters, uh, very easy to say so, is Berlin, the Berlin chapter. You see here Berlin somewhere on the right-hand side. It's not just the city, but it's the chapter, because in Berlin alone are more than 700, I think now close to 800 alumni living. If you count yourself as students and faculty and staff, et cetera, true, we'll be about 2,000 probably here living in Berlin, working for the um, Hattie School. So uh, within that Berlin chapter, you may interact on various um, levels and topics, we call it interest groups, et cetera, et cetera, you'll be most invited to do so. So please be a part uh, of this ever-growing and quite widely spread uh, network. The second part are the hygiene rules. We um, have opened the university, and we're so happy to see all of you and many more of you here in the hallways, and on the roof garden, in the classes, etc. And we want to stay open. In order to stay open for the whole academic year, we need to be a safe campus. I think we put in place reasonable measures, uh, hygiene rules and measures in order to, to be a safe campus. We have now the hygiene policy of the high school number six to come. So, oh, six different policies, all evolving, of course, adapting to the legal situation we do have in Germany, etc., and pandemic situation. You see here one of some, some of the um, main aspects you're probably all aware of. I don't want to get into any details, but please contribute that we stay open and that we stay a safe campus. And with that, I would turn it over to Mark.
Now, as you can see from uh, the title of the talk, uh, the pandemic did not uh, leave our research agendas unaffected. And um, yeah, this reflected really in, in, in much of our research that we've been doing over the last year. And like what you will see is really just a tiny bit of research of, of that broader agenda. Now let me start with uh, sort of the, uh, the, the bigger picture. And as a policy school, we're interested in governance issues. So um, what about governance during a pandemic? What were the big challenges? Uh, now, um, as Mark already told you, my background is in political science, but I do a whole range of things. Governance per se um, as a theoretical conceptual topic is not at the core of what I'm doing. Um, so you should talk to other colleagues at Herdy um, about that more, but like my impression was that 2020 was really a year full of challenges, uh, of difficult decisions for policymakers, and um, this includes making sense of scientific evidence, in, partic in particular when you don't have a scientific background, uh, then making decisions um, based on this evidence, but also making decisions that work in your population for the people, and implement these decisions, communicate these decisions. So incredibly tough decisions to make. Now we're more than a year into the pandemic and like it hasn't ended yet, but um, with effective vaccines uh, more or less widely available, the situation has become much better, but I believe that um, some of the key challenges for governance still uh, persist. They have not gone away. Now we here at Herdy and, and in Germany and in Europe, um, we can think and have in fact started to think about how to go back to normal and the fact that we're meeting here today is, is one step into that direction. But obviously in much of the rest of the world, um, this is far from being true. So with that in mind, the concrete challenge in the context of uh, governing uh, during a pandemic that I'm gonna focus on in that talk is certainly not the key or the most urgent challenge, but I think it's a very interesting one, in particular when you're interested in public policy, study public policy, and also data science um, here at the Herty School. Now, what's the challenge I wanna talk about in a bit more detail? Uh, it's a challenge of contact tracing, and we've all learned a lot about that challenge. So contact tracing is one of the key techniques to break transmission chains in like the context of the pandemic of, of, of COVID-19. And it was particularly important when there was no vaccine and no other like medical treatment available. And it's still critical. It's still cr a critical tool to break transmission chains because obviously not everybody's vaccinated and even if you are vaccinated, you can still transmit the disease. Um, and um, things are probably getting worse again in terms of contact tracing, right? So incidence rates go up, as you can see, at least in some contexts, since Germany is among them, um, and vaccination doesn't fully prevent transmission. So when governments and policymakers and scientists thought about that problem last year, um, one idea popped up. And the idea was to supplement classical contract tracing, which would involve local health authorities to call people, to tell them to get tested or to isolate, to supplement that with uh, new tools that are around the corner, in particular digital contact tracing. So one feature of the times we're living in is that all of us have smartphones in our pockets and with smartphones comes technology that is in principle um, able to track where you're going to or which people you meet. And these tools, these technologies, uh, that was the idea of t uh, digital contact tracing could be exploited to make classical contact tracing more more effective or like supplemented um, basically via two ways. The one would be to just like automatically digitally logging um, when you would meet another person also wearing such a device and like having the, the respective software installed um, and, and logging that automatically. And second, and this is as important, um, speeding up the notification and potentially testing or isolation process. Because like one problem that you face when incidence rates go up is that the local health authorities are just overwhelmed, right? So they cannot reach you uh, fast enough, the virus um, uh, spreads faster. Right. So this was the potential of uh, digital contact tracing tools. There was, were also risks involved, right? So we're talking about sensitive data, uh, where people go to, how they uh, move, whom they meet, potentially coupled with health information. So that's certainly critical. 
um, then you could think of um, misusing that data for alternative means, right? So tracking down people who are potentially criminals, interesting for, for police work, or potentially dissidents, or you can think of other cases where this is uh, potentially risky and dangerous. And then, of course, when governments take action in terms of tracking people uh, on the ground, uh, this might just reinforce distrust. And from a government's, uh, a government's perspective, this is, of course, um, fatal. There are also practical challenges. So when you want to really trace people and trace contacts, you need as many people as possible to use these tools. Right? So, and this became obvious pretty early on, and there were like, really like, uh, significant simulation studies run in early 2020 that highlighted the need for widespread adoption of these, of these tools. Now, when, when talking about potential use cases, potential risks, but also practical challenges, we're basically talking about a pro policy problem and what, it's, what is associated to it. Now, some of the underlying problems are, are normative, and we can also inform normative questions with uh, scientific debates. Some were just like technological issues, right? So the privacy problem could hopefully at least partially be solved um, technologically. But uh, there's one aspect that uh, me and my colleagues at Herdy um, could really speak to as social data scientists, and that's the, the human factor, the behavioral factor, right? And this really uh, speaks to the last point of um, how and when and um, do people actually use these, uh, use these tools. So this brings me closer to uh, the case we were then, in fact, studying. Uh, so if you don't know yet, yet, a little bit of background to um, yeah, the German case. Um, so the German government decided fairly early on to invest uh, in digital technologies to support contact tracing on the ground. And after a somewhat like lengthy, uh, well, implementation phase, the official app, the Corona Warn app, or CWA, uh, launched uh, more than a year ago, year ago in June 2020. And um, in fact, it was quite popular, and it's still quite popular. It's one of the most popular contact tracing apps worldwide. So as of now, when you look at the official numbers, uh, we see more than 30 million downloads, which is, of course, still only a fraction of the entire population, but it's certainly a big number. And you see the trajectory of uptake in the plot over there. Um, now, the app was popular maybe also because of some design choices that were made early on. And one of these choices were, was the privacy by design principle. That is to keep as much information as possible decentrally stored, that is only on your devices. So no central servers where like governments could yeah, access them and then, like do, do bad things with them. Um, at the same time, the privacy by design principle made it really hard, almost impossible I would say, to effectively evaluate the usage um, and the effectiveness of these tools. And that's something you would want to do with an um, evidence-based policy-making mindset, right? So you wouldn't just stop at rolling out such, such a technology, but you would also like to like, test its, its effectiveness, also to make like, uh, downstream decisions of like, how to promote it further. So basically, two questions that speak to the human factor in that. And the one is, um, who uses the app? Like, which parts of the population, but also just like, how many? Because like, the download numbers alone are probably not telling you that, right? You can download an app multiple times, you can download, delete it again, and so on. And second, um, and this, uh, well, speaks to the fact that um, we're not reaching like the population maximum here. How, how can we increase uptake, right? So to really have an, a coverage, covered rates that work, that make uh, these, these tools really uh, useful. Now before I uh, tell you how we try to tackle these questions, and these were the key uh, research questions we, we tried to answer in our project, um, let me briefly give you a little bit of backstory of how we turned into COVID researchers because like two years ago, uh, we couldn't imagine to do research somewhat related to epidemiology or somewhat related. I mean, like we're political scientists after all. And with me, by the way, I'm not speaking only of myself, but also with uh, uh, from like uh, Anita Gordes, uh, our professor of international cybersecurity as well as uh, Will Lowe, uh, the best uh, senior, uh, sen senior research scientist we have at Herdy. That's not only because he's the only one, um, he's, he's really good. So he was part of the team and two other external uh, people, Lukas Stratzer and Peter Sell. Now, um, a couple of years ago, um, I was, uh, and I'm still doing that, um, working with a couple of people from the United States on something completely different. We were interested 
in um, uh, the effects of online media consumption for political preferences and behavior. So what does it do to you when you spend your day on Fox News? Or maybe a, like, a little bit less uh, like negative story, what does it do to you when you use voting advice applications like the German Wahlomat to like learn about where p parties stand for? By the way, this is a tool that like just recently launched again last week. People use it to learn about like online, to learn about party positions and the like. And we wanted to know like what does the internet, broadly speaking, what does this change preferences and behavior? Now in order to learn about that, we um, basically used a fairly novel computational data collection setup that is a consequence of the times we're living in and that we can draw on as, as data scientists but also as policy analysts. This comes from the fact that um, you all have turned into your own measurement device, like with your smartphone in your pocket, with your um, laptop um, in your office, you are actively producing data that others can use. So what we did was basically to recruit thousands of people in the United States and Germany and track them online. So we had a like 360 degree view of what they would be doing in terms of like which websites they would visit, but also which apps they would use on their smartphone with their consent, of course. So this is not um, Cambridge all the get hurry. Um, and uh, yeah, we learned about these things, right? So we have these, like this, this measurement device. Now last year, um, when uh, we learned that the German government would plan to launch an app um, that would uh, like digitally trace um, like contacts during the pandemic, we had this epiphany, right? So we have the perfect measurement device, the perfect data collection set up. I would say close to perfect, or not even that, but like we had a reasonably convincing set up um, to actually track down who would use this app and how often and in what context. And this would like, let us just circumvent the privacy by design principle, right? So um, this is what we were uh, doing then. Now the, the study setup looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually straightforward. So what we actually had was, uh, so we recruited people from a commercial access panel. So they consented to be like tracked online, I already told you that, but also uh, were willing to answer questions repeatedly over time. So there's a survey component attached to it. And this component uh, gives us information about their reported behavior, about their attitudes, preferences, all in the context of the pandemic, but also beyond. Uh, and of course, also like social demographic factors. And then finally, the, the, there's a third factor, and that's the like uh, experimental stimuli factor. So we also wanted to try out how we could change uh, the usage of the app. And this would then speak to the second question, how we could actually uh, increase, uh, increase uptake. So that's the setup in a nutshell. Um, and here's what we find out um, with regards to the first question. So who is using these apps? And um, is that potentially problematic? Again, like from an epidemiological um, perspective. So what you see here is basically usage rates that we find in our panel that we observe from like observing people's smartphones uh, within like multiple subgroups. So that's the survey data. So uh, just to pick out a couple of interesting patterns, um, we have age, right? And what we find is that it's not the, the young, it's not the digital natives that use these tools the most, at least in our panel. And we could talk about whether that's an artifact of our panel, but it's interesting nevertheless to see that the oldest people in our panel used it most. And there's a second potentially even more problem, I mean, age is probably not problematic, right? I mean, it's problematic when you think about like younger people being more mobile and potentially more like transmissive. Um, but what's really problematic is the second relationship and that's NPI compliance. What does that mean? So people comply with other like non-pharmaceutical health measures like interventions, adhering to social distancing rules, wearing masks all the time and these people also happen to be the people who use the app most often. And that's unfortunate, right? Because like they are already complying. They're probably already less likely to transmit the disease. So that's really an unfavorable distribution in the population, which makes you wonder whether the like original numbers in the theoretical simulations are that robust. Now as a policy school, we also wonder about like how people think about policy or politics or polity. 
And here's another somewhat unfortunate relationship. It's maybe trivial to note, but it's, uh, it's stark. And that's the trust in government. And you see also, it's also like trust in science, trust in the healthcare system. And we have a strong difference in app uptake between those who trust the government and those who don't, which makes sense because it was the government who disseminated and is still disseminating the app. It's unfortunate because like trust in the government is difficult to pick up or like to just to boost. It's certainly easier to like lower trust. And you could say that like some measures of the government over the last year have contributed to, to a lowering of trust. And finally, but this is maybe obvious, if you're already digitally literate, like you're comfortable with using digital tools, you use it more often. But that's also a challenge to overcome. Uh, like just to teach people how to use smartphones, how to keep uh, the Bluetooth connection open, and so on. Okay, that's the descriptive findings, and then we try to actually bring in some movement here. Now, um, we had two main ideas. The first was like a more idealistic take. Uh, and here the, the idea was, uh, let's just tell people how great this app is. Because we knew from previous surveys that people in particular have a problem with uh, privacy issues. And uh, they were also skeptical about the effectiveness of the app. But like one of the most commonly voiced concerns was like, uh, I don't want to share my data with the government. So basically what we did was to show them a video. Like this is just a two minute video. Um, an explainer video telling them like this app is safe, it works like this and that, and um, it's really useful. Right? And in addition to that, we added an appeal uh, at the end of the message. Um, and we had two different groups. One would be an appeal to pro-sociality, basically saying if you use the app, you protect the most vulnerable in the population. And another uh, message would appeal more to those who are maybe mainly self-interested, right? And here the story was when you use the app, you increase the chances uh, that you can get back to normal uh, sooner. Now, did that work? Um, unfortunately not for the key outcome, right? So when you look at uptake, uh, you see the, like these graphs that you don't want to see when you like, pre-register your experiment, you're really enthusiastic about your treatment, and then there is just not much movement, right? They, yeah, participants just don't comply. So uh, like what these numbers basically tell you is that like the treatment group didn't change much in comparison to the control group in terms of like tracked app uptake over time. Now what we did observe was effects on knowledge and positive attitudes. So people became substantively more knowledgeable about the app, which made sense because this is exactly what the, what the video transported. Um, it also made them a little bit more positive about the app. I'm like, these are nice, but ultimately soft outcomes, right? We were interested in the hard outcomes. Um, so what we tried next was uh, to take a more economic approach. And the economists in the room would have probably told us to just, just do this in the first place because we know this from, uh, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years of, of, of research on that. And that is incentives work. So what we did was to provide, um, again, experimentally, direct monetary incentives, small incentives though, like one, two, or five euros, um, to uh, self-reported non-users in our sample. So basically we told them, okay, you, you told us you don't use the app. Um, here's what we wanna do. We wanna give you two euros um, if you're willing to use it. And then they would say yes or no, right? And this is uh, like one, one measure to, like one way to measure the outcome. But again, like we would also track what they, what they actually did, right? So we could also track whether they comply. And um, well, what did we find? Like now the picture is reversed, right? So no changes in knowledge and attitudes, which makes sense. There is no informative value in money in this, uh, in this experiment. But we saw a strong increase in the uptake. So this translates to roughly like an increase of 20 percentage points in this group of like previously like app non-users. And this is, I mean, you could say this is trivial. You pay users to use the app and then they use it. But note that these were people who uh, like had taken surveys before on the app. They were informed about the app. Um, they were probably more like digitally uh, knowledgeable because they were members of an online panel. We basically wanted to know like are these like hardcore uh, defiers or deniers of the app? Turns out, well, maybe some of them are, but you can, you can reach something. So uh, findings in a nutshell, descriptively speaking, um, 
the app usage, uh, as we found it last year, was really unfavorably correlated with a couple of characteristics. And that's something we as, as like social data scientists can really speak to, right? That's something that is rarely addressed in simulation studies. Um, and then informative appeals work if you want to increase uh, knowledge. Um, if you want to increase app usage, maybe think about small incentives, right? So the next step would have obviously been for the German government to like just scale this up, find ways to turn that into a feasible policy, give out credit on app stores for people who would install the app. Now this didn't happen. Uh, maybe I'm like just not like the person to like play this game or we didn't do it right. But um, at least there's one thing we did, right? We provided the evidence that could then be used uh, to turn it into policy. And like, there is more to that, right? So there were follow-up studies, and like, we, we did more work on communicating these findings. Um, before I end my talk, um, like, one, one key feature of research on the pandemic is, of course, that like, research results are quickly outlived by reality. Um, so we, we did follow-up studies earlier this year um, and they changed the picture somewhat, but like we're like that's that's for another talk or another um, meeting. Um, generally, um, the app is kind of a success story, right? So you see the uh, the uptake uh, numbers. They're like an in international comparison. They are high, and even now, as vaccines become available. Contact tracing is still a thing. It's, it's relevant, it's still relevant. It's maybe all the more relevant now that we're meeting again. Uh, transmission rates go up, incidence rates go up. Uh, there's just one problem, uh, and that's a fundamental skepticism about these tools in the public, um, about like privacy and the, 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 the effectiveness. Now, there, like, there are a couple of more stories to tell. One of the story would be that uh, the, the Corona Warn app would not be the only app um, to be used for contact tracing. So you've heard about the Luca app. This was one of the commercial um, competitors entering the market in response to, well, regulations. So the Corona Warn app is still not enough to run events like these or to run, run teaching at Herdy. So in the case of a positive case, um, institutions like Herdy, but also like restaurants or like just any other event places, they have to provide contact lists to the health authorities. That's nothing you can do with a like, tool like the Corona Warn app, which by design doesn't store these features and doesn't give out these features, right? And that's where, yeah, basically a market was created for commercial competitors. Um, some of these apps are highly problematic, but um, from a, say, like governance perspective at the Herdy School, there's basically two things um, you should do, which is, um, well, use the Luca app to log in when you um, attend a teaching event or other events, right? That's important, like this helps us to comply with the official regulations. But in the light of these findings and many other studies, also use the Corona Warn app to make, well, to make a real contribution to, uh, well, basically containing, uh, containing the pandemic. All right, oh, sorry. I I have one last slide. That's the most important slide of all. So this was only a tiny bit of research that happened uh, on, uh, on COVID-19 at the Herdy School. Um, there was so much more and is so much more happening right now. Here you see just a couple of like really shining examples of faculty members, also of students who engaged with the topic, provided really important input for, for policymakers and helped contribute to, to what our core mission at Herdy is, which is like understand today and shape tomorrow. So uh, with that, I wish you an exciting and inspiring, life-changing time at Herdy. Let's have this time together. And we can't wait to see you become a member of this community, contribute to great research in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I, I think you also pointed out why I wanted to just point out that this was the inaugural lecture for the opening, of course, of our Master of Data Science and Public Policy. And one thing that you see here is the data science, but the stress on why public policy is so important. Right? How do people react to this? How do they behave? What sorts of things look good on paper but maybe don't work well in practice? And practical examples for policy that have some sort of effect 
on the real world. And I very much appreciate that you highlighted, of course, some of your other colleagues and our colleagues as well in terms of some of the research that's here. I hope this inspires you. It inspired me, Simon. I think these are the sorts of things we'd like to see. And as you're here at the Head Tea School, especially those of you who are here for the, your first opening days, I think you've got an exciting time ahead of you in the coming years. So before you get to those big picture things, there's a small picture thing called a reception. And if you happen to have a little armband that's blue, which I hope you got when you came in, please go downstairs to the Q Club, which is where the Deutsche Bank is. Banks sometimes have little reception areas that are interesting. They don't just have money. So go down there to the first floor, and uh, I look forward to seeing some of you there. If you're online and you can't come, thank you so much for participating in this event virtually, and we look forward to seeing all of you, either virtually or in person, in the coming years. Thank you. Yeah, of course.